Jehovah God, our Heavenly Father, we wish to approach you at this time. We're very glad to be assembled here before you, to be instructed by you and uh, care for you in this way. We appreciate the brothers and sisters here we have to associate with to build us up, help us to be encouraging to one another uh, this day and uh, assisting one another in any way we can. We appreciate being here at your table to um, have these words of comfort and uh, of things discourse to us. We uh, look to you, Jehovah, as our refuge and help us to listen closely to see how we can uh, make you that uh, in our lives forever. We appreciate, too, being able to assist our brothers and sisters in whatever way, so help us to be um, mindful of their needs and help us to uh, consider this in our watchtower today. Uh, be with Brother Perry as he discusses this information with us and our watchtower conductor also. So we ask for your spirit. And we offer this prayer now, Lord, forgive us for our sins through Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our speaker is Brother Nathaniel Perry from Apple Valley. He's going to deliver this discourse on Jehovah is our refuge, or why take refuge in Jehovah. <laughs> refuge, as a definition, is a shelter or protection from danger or trouble. It's a place of shelter, protection, and safety. Anything to which one has recourse for aid, relief, or escape. And all of us have some way or somehow seen someone take refuge in something. Here in the hall, we can see a small child who disappear behind their mother, afraid of a six foot five man. The mother's maybe four foot tall. And she, he thinks he's still going to get some protection from that mother, right? He has faith in that person. His mother was a refuge to him. Sometimes we may see a young lady out shopping at the mall. All of a sudden it starts raining. What do they do? They immediately run inside trying to get refuge from the mall so that hair won't get messed up. On a little more serious note, some families experience experience hostility from neighbors that they lived next door to for a long time. <clears throat> Could have been living there for 10, 12 years, and they've known them all their life. But all of a sudden, politics get into play, and they become enemies. After living next door, some soldiers start coming to their house. Within 10 minutes, they only have enough time to pack up their equipment pack up whatever they can and leave. This family has now become refuge, refugees. And this is happening all over the, the world. We have it in Iraq. We see it in Syria, Afghanistan. We've seen it in Ukraine. It's happening everywhere. People worldwide are seeking refuge. In every nation, people seek escape from fear, sickness, family problems, Emotional distress, the onslaught of crime, they have a sense of hopelessness. And the fear of death alone moves millions to seek refuge in a multitude of contradictory beliefs. They have superstitions and myths that they go by, that they make up to make themselves feel bad. Take, for instance, Friday the 13th. The world thinks that that's a bad luck day. Oh, it's Friday the 13th. I'm not going to leave the house. You've heard this. Well, it all started from one of the, say, th history says it started from when Friday the October 13th, 1307, there was a destruction of the Knights Templar. These were people that were doing the Crusades. They killed all of them people on the 13th of Friday. And that's why they said it was a bad luck day. Now, it may have been bad luck for Knights Templar, but as far as people in the world, it's just another day, but they looked at that that way. That's how superstitions and myths start. Some people believe in order to bring good luck to their house and to keep nightmares away, that you hang a horseshoe over your bed with the opening part up, facing up, or hang it on your door. 
We've heard of that before. Or have you ever wondered why bells are always associated with weddings and special occasions? Well, it turns out that bells are sounded during special occasions due to widely held beliefs that bells frighten evil spirits away. And this started not with common folks. This started with Queen Elizabeth's reign for two reasons. Queen Elizabeth of England, she said she wanted to ask for prayers for the departed soul and drive away evil spirits. Those evil spirits that stood at the foot of their bed. See, these are things that come up in people's mind that they're afraid of, so they develop something to help them as a refuge. People are afraid, and they create these different refuge. Well, we know that whether they're conscious of it or not, these people that are seeking refuge. But these promises are superstitions, they lead to disappointment. None of it ever works. And I want you to turn with me to Proverbs 14, 12. At Proverbs 14, 12, the Bible even speaks about these people. Here at Proverbs 14, 12, it says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. So we see these people, they think that this is the right way. They made this up and they believe in it, but eventually it leads to their death. Nothing can protect them from anything except we know what it is. The question then becomes, where can people go? What, can, what kind of refuge do they need? And to answer these questions, you have to understand what is the underlying cause of the problem. As Christians and Bible students, we can see how the world focuses on problems affecting humankind. We see that. The world doesn't recognize the underlying problem because their problems and why they even seeking refuge. They don't understand that, that there's a real underlying problem. But Bible students, again, that life and genuine happiness is linked inextricably to God and obedience to his law. Let's turn to Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Jehovah, we know Jehovah created everything, and he alone knows what works best for us because he knows how it operates. So Ecclesiastes 12, 13, it says, the conclusion of the matter, everything having been heard is, fear the true God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole obligation of man. Jehovah created everything. He knows how it works. So with that in mind, we can see from the scriptures that man was created to depend on God and he has spiritual needs. When man doesn't turn to God, when he doesn't pay any mind to him, and he doesn't seek Jehovah as a refuge, then man will depend on his own path. He'll go with his own mind. He'll start thinking for himself, creating superstitious sayings, and trying to use those to protect himself from evil things that was going to get him under the bed or whatever. But he's no longer looking at Jehovah as a refuge. Let's take a look at Jeremiah 10, 50. I'm sorry, 10, 23. I'm reading my page numbers off. At Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, it says, I well know, O Jehovah, that man's way does not belong to him, it does not belong to man who is walking even to direct his steps. So man's way doesn't belong to him, and he doesn't understand the meaning of life, but we know that God alone gives meaning to life. He created this life. So creation, but we look at it, we know that it can give meaning to life. It reflects Jehovah's divine wisdom. The Earth's orbit around the sun is an example. 
If the earth was one degree closer or one degree away from the sun, we know that it's inhabitable to man. He couldn't live here. The water cycle of the earth. We know that the water is drawn up from the lakes, goes into the cloud and rains down. Then it goes back into the rivers and lakes. That cycle continues for years and years, for centuries. That gives meaning to life. How about our bodies? It reflects Jehovah's wisdom. It heals itself when it cuts or when it's injured. Does it not? In fact, scientists say that the way it heals itself, we should never get old and die. We should live forever. Jehovah created all of us. With such great wisdom, Jehovah would be the perfect refuge for humans. However, the first human couple willingly turned their backs on Jehovah, abandoned their relationship with him, and rejected him as their refuge. They gave it up. And this is what humans today are faced with, an inherited rejection of Jehovah's refuge, showing us the underlying cause of man's problem on earth today. That's why it's happening. That's why we're doing it. That's why those worldly people are seeking refuge in superstition. Adam and Eve failed to satisfy their spiritual needs, and through their actions, sin entered into the world causing us, as their descendants, to be imperfect. And this imperfection causes even those who profess to be Christians to become lukewarm in their godly devotion. All of us. That's talking to all of us. Let me read that again. This imperfection causes even those who profess to be Christians to become lukewarm in their godly devotion. Jesus in a message to Laodicea in Revelation 3.15. Let's turn there. Made a statement. In Revelation 3.15 it says, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or else hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. That's a deep statement. Why would Jesus want to vomit some servants out of his mouth? Well, if we read on to verse 17, it says, Because you say, I am rich, and have acquired riches, and do not need anything at all, but you do not know that you are miserable, and pitiful, and poor, and blind, and naked. You see, Jesus pointed out that the Christians in Laodicea were no longer dependent on Jehovah. They were dependent on their riches. They were forfeiting their spiritual needs. So by failing to satisfy their spiritual needs, they were not taking refuge in Jehovah. And that's why he was going to vomit them out. They weren't dependent on him. And this is a warning to us now. <clears throat> that we need to examine our priorities. We need to ask ourselves, is our spirituality as well as our relationship with Jehovah first place? Is it our first priority? Are we making Jehovah our refuge? Unfailing refuge can only be found in Jehovah. Even the name of Jehovah is a strong tower and a refuge, and to run into it to do this, it takes, it takes some effort. It takes action. And let's turn to Proverbs 18.10. <coughs> because even that name of Jehovah, it says it's a stronghold, a strong tower. Proverbs chapter 18. And verse 10, here it says, The name of Jehovah is a strong tower. Into it the righteous one runs and receives protection. He runs. So, we see that as the righteous runs into the strong tower, they don't sit there and stand and wait for the tower to come over to them. They'll never get the protection. 
if you wait for the tower to come to you. You have to run to the car. And it's a conscious effort. How do you do that? Well, we come to the meetings. We have meeting attendance. We have prayer. We have meditation, personal study, self-examination. All of this is a part of running into the tower. If we don't do those things, in essence, we'll wait for that tower to come to us. Do you think that tower is going to come to you by itself? You have to effortly, they have to make an effort to go to the tower. In the Holy Scripture, God tells us of his purpose for mankind. Jehovah created man to enjoy everlasting, happy life in paradise. And his will for Mankind is that all people should make one family united in love and peace. One family. And God explains this reason for mankind's suffering and shows that salvation is possible even though we go through all this suffering. Remember Revelation 21 4 says that he'll wipe out every tear from their eyes and death will be no more. Neither will mourning nor outcry nor pain be anymore. The former things have passed away. Jehovah is showing us that in the future he's going to take care of all that. And sometimes our imperfection, sometimes we say, when? When is this going to happen? Sometimes I get out of bed and I can't move as fast as I used to. I used to get out of bed and say, macho man, <laughs> I'm young and I can go through everything. Not anymore. Knees are talking to me. I say, get back in bed. <laughs> Sometimes we ask ourselves that. When will this happen? And that's due to our imperfection. At Psalm 37, 10, it says, Just a little while longer, the wicked one will be no more. Jehovah's going to do away with them. So what do we do until this happens? How do we conduct ourselves until, we, until Jehovah comes and gets rid of the wicked one? We keep seeking first the kingdom of God. Because we have to have, we have that hope of everlasting life, the hope of love and peace in a brand new world. Jehovah's described to us that He's bringing something new. And if Jehovah is to be our place of refuge, then we have to seek His righteousness and live by it. We just can't talk about it. We got to actually do what Jehovah asks us to do. Let's take a look at a melody of David. It asks two interesting questions and answers them at the same time. It's Psalms 15, 1. Psalms 15, 1. It says, O Jehovah, who may be a guest in your tent? Who may reside in your holy mountain?" The one who is walking faultlessly, practicing what is right, and speaking the truth in his heart. Now notice here that it said walking. It didn't say that you walked. Because when you say you walked, that means that it's already done and you finished with it. And the only way you can be done and finished with it is that if you died, none of us look dead here. Or you stop serving. You stop believing. That's the only way you can say that you walked. You used to do it. So here it says that we're walking faultlessly. In other words, we are learning Jehovah's ways. We're learning his word and practicing it. And that's interesting too. Because we can enter by practicing his ways. And then we are welcome to the holy mountain if we are walking faultlessly. Otherwise, another term for that is acquiring accurate knowledge. But look at this one at uh, Hebrews 10, 26. Because there's some other people that may not be doing this. <coughs> Hebrews 10, 26. <coughs> I'm so used to the tablet now. Okay, here we go. At Hebrews 10, 26, 
it says, For if we practice sin willfully, after having received the accurate knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice for sins left, but there is a certain fearful expectation of judgment and a burning indignation that is going to consume those in opposition. So it's talking about practicing sin. You can practice righteousness, you can practice sin, but those practicing righteousness are what? Righteous people. They're welcome into Jehovah's holy mountain. Those practicing sin, he's saying this, that he has something else for you, something else in store. And we can think about those things in terms of like a doctor practicing medicine. He's known as a physician or a doctor. Football player practicing football. He's a football player. You can say practice with anything. But when you put it with practicing righteousness, we know all these little details that go along with that. We know all, uh, there's a lot of meeting attendance. There's a lot of prayer. That's the things that we do to practice righteousness and to run into that tower. <coughs> Jehovah opens the door to, to be our refuge through ransom sacrifice of his son. The scriptures say in 1 John 2 that he is propitiatory sacrifice for our sins, yet not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So if we're walking faultlessly and practicing righteousness, then we have an obligation. And that obligation is found in Matthew 28, 20 that tells us that we need to go out and teach others to observe his commandments. That's our obligation. We have to go out and talk about this. Because how would the world know if there is no one to teach them? And how, and we do have that responsibility to go out and teach people. No one would ever know about Jehovah if no one would go out. You know, we don't really want the rocks to crowd. Remember Jesus said that you have these rocks crowd and some people wouldn't announce it. We don't want rocks speaking out for us, do we? I'd rather be one that says, for well, at least on my half, to say for myself that Jesus is the Christ, that Jehovah is the ruler of the universe. Let's look at 1 John 2, 3. Here we have... First John 2... Verse 3, it says, And by this we realize that we have come to know him, namely, if we continue observing his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him, and yet does not observe his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in this person. But whoever does observe his word, in this person the love of God has truly been made perfect. By this, we know that we are in union with him. So we see the importance of observing his commandments. We see the importance of teaching others. And it's to come to know him, to get others to come to know them, to draw close, so that when we can depend on him to be our refuge. Get to know him. Understand why, why is it that we need to run into that tower? Jehovah has encouragement for us because his word is encouraging and uplifting. And sometimes in the congregation, we, we get down on ourselves. We don't come in here in the best of spirit all the time, do we? Sometimes we come in a little low. But his word is encouraging and uplifting. And if we don't observe those words, then how else will we know when you're depressed what to do? Jehovah, you know, you started those commercials, uh, I got an app for that on your computer, these tablets and stuff now. I got an app for that. But Jehovah's got an app for anything that you go through, any, any kind of feeling that you may have. For instance, think about this. If you said, I'm depressed, Jehovah's app, or his word as a refuge 
It says Jehovah is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm 34, 18. What if you said, I don't have enough faith? Jehovah's app says, I've given everyone a measure of faith. Matthew 7, 7. What if you said, sometimes I just want to give up? Jehovah's word says, don't. Fight the fine fight of the faith. 1 Timothy 6, 12. Jehovah's word, what if you said, I've sinned? Well, Jehovah's Word said, I'm ready to forgive, Psalm 86, 5. What if you said, I'm anxious over many things, Jehovah? His Word says, don't be anxious over anything, Philippians 4, 6. This one is particular. I want you to turn to this one. I really like this one. This is found at Le Leviticus 13 and 40. And here it says, if a man loses his hair <laughs> of his head and becomes bald, he is clean. Now, I know it's talking about leprosy and all, but think about those people that are losing their hair. How encouraging is this to us? <clears throat> Jehovah has an app for everything that we can think of. If you need encouragement, Jehovah's word is a refuge. Jehovah has an app for that. There's nothing we can say that Jehovah's Word can't provide encouragement, but you have to apply it. You have to run into that tower. Listen to how this sister dealt with schizophrenia using Jehovah's provision. This is from a watchtower, 89, August 15. Here it says, I've been suffering for 10 years with schizophrenia. Friend. She took to listening to the kingdom melodies and stated how soothing and relaxing this was. She thanked Jehovah and said, you sure do know what delights your people. And I fall back to sleep. Believe me, it was better than any medicine I could take. So even words and music provided through Jehovah's provision can be a refuge to us. They can calm us. They can soothe and encourage us. Refuge can be found in all aspects of Jehovah's provisions for us. And we receive new provisions from the assembly, from the, didn't we? Everybody enjoying those provisions, right? We receiving them all the time, they're updated. Based on Jesus' ransom, we can seek refuge through prayer because it cleanses us and of sin and provides a way to enter into a close relationship with God. When we pray to Jehovah and let him know how we feel, we're actually communicating to him and let him know that we need him as a refuge. Now, do we always pray to Jehovah when we need something, when we're feeling bad? We shouldn't. If you woke up this morning, you should be thanking Jehovah that you have woken up. If you see the sun and it makes you happy, Jehovah, thank you for the sun. You're recognizing Jehovah's creation and how beautiful it is to you. I know on a spring day when the grass is just freshly cut, I love that smell of fresh cut grass. And I immediately say, Jehovah, thank you. <laughs> it smells so good. <clears throat> These are times when you start making a strong connection with Jehovah. You're building up a relationship with him. So when you do come to a point in time that you were real low to the ground, Jehovah doesn't have a hard time pulling you up. He can easily reach down and say, come on, son. Come on, daughter. Everything's going to be okay. <clears throat> Pressures and problems are multiplying in the last days, marked by critical times hard to deal with. And trials can easily preoccupy our mind. <clears throat> our incessant prayers, however, will help us to keep our lives on a spiritual course despite persistent problems, <clears throat> temptations, and discouragement. Our daily prayers with Jehovah can provide the refuge <clears throat> we need. So we keep on 
taking refuge in Jehovah. No matter what, we try to stay in that tower so that we can have his protection. My final scripture for today is Psalm 91. And this is what our song was taken from. Opening song. Psalm 91, verse 1. It says, anyone dwelling in the secret place of the Most High will lodge under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to Jehovah, you are my refuge and my stronghold, my God in whom I trust. So we see that Jehovah invites all mankind to take advantage of his provisions as a refuge. Those of us that know this have to teach those others to observe Jehovah's provisions. So we exercise faith in the ransom, stay close to God's visible organization, and be determined to continue taking spiritual refuge in Jehovah, for this leads to eternal life on par and paradise earth. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Perry. We appreciate you showing us how we can make Jehovah our refuge, the benefits of that. Now, we invite you back next week for another public talk here where we're going to receive more instruction and encouragement. So please be with us in. And now we've come to the point where it's a highlight of our week, our discussion of the Watchtower, here our main source of instruction through the faithful slave. So let's give our attention to Brother Haston as he uh, starts us into that discussion. We've come to our last study in our May issue, and certainly still an enjoyable watchtower for us as we learn how to deal with 